Hi, welcome to War Christ. This is a channel dedicated to Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox alike. Today I'm joined by Brother Guy Consumano. He's an American research astronomer, a physicist, a Jesuit religious brother, and director of the Vatican Observatory. He's also the president of the Vatican Observatory Foundation. Just to begin then, Brother Guy, if we may, um, I'd love to start with your origin story. Can you tell us a bit about your background and some of the key currents that brought you from Detroit, USA to become known and loved as the Pope's astronomer? Loved, I'm not so sure about. Uh, first, first, I want to confess I've got a bit of an Irish background. My mother was Patricia Duffy, and that's a fairly common mixture in America, half Irish, half Italian. Uh, my parents were both practicing Catholics, but also um, college educated, and I grew up as a baby boomer at that time when all little boys were going to be scientists, and certainly it was boys in those days, not girls, sadly. When I got to the age of going to high school, I went to a Jesuit high school, and there I got introduced to the classics, Latin and Greek. And so I thought at that point, well, maybe I'll be, you know, a lawyer like my Italian father or a journalist like my father. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I chose to go to Boston College, which was the Jesuit University in Boston, because I wanted to be near the Jesuits and because I loved the, uh, the idea of being in Boston. But I found it was not happy there. Um, I wasn't, I didn't really fit in with the, the party atmosphere that the school had back in those days. They're talking 50 years ago. I'm sure it's not like that today. <laughs> and I found myself spending most of my time hanging out with my best friend from high school who was studying at MIT. And that harkened back to my youth when I was going to be the, you know, the, the scientist who was gonna discover the uh, origin of the universe or something. <laughs> So mostly I hang out, hung out there because I had a great science fiction collection. But on a whim, I decided to apply as a transfer student. And they said, well, you've got to choose a major. And, you know, I'm not going to be an engineer. I'm pretty clumsy with my hands and certainly not a physics major at MIT. That seemed overwhelming. But I saw this major that said Earth and Planetary Sciences. Planets, I thought that was astronomy. So I signed up for that. And when they interviewed me, I said, well, maybe I'll be a science journalist because I'd been doing journalism before then. That was the flavor of the week they admitted me. And only then did I discover that I had signed up for the geology department. And I thought, what could be more boring than rocks? But I was just so happy to be at MIT, I didn't care. Mm -hmm. And then I discovered that there are rocks that fall out of the sky from the asteroid belt. They're called meteorites. And the thought that you could actually hold a piece of outer space in your hand was so thrilling to me that I fell in love with everything to do with geology and geophysics and geochemistry and the geology of other planets. And that's been my passion ever since. Mm, beautiful. And now you're living in Arizona. Um, or, sorry. Well, I'm, I'm half the year in Arizona and I'm half the year in Rome. It turns out that, of course, there was a long trip between here and there. I had this, you know, why am I doing astronomy when people are starving in the world? So after I'd gotten my doctorate at Arizona, um, I went into the Peace Corps and that was great. But I discovered why you do astronomy when people are starving, because astronomy is one of those things that makes you look at the world with bigger eyes than just, you know, what am I going to have for lunch? Mm -hmm. Much as religion did. And that, that call to be a Jesuit brother never went away. I, you know, I was nearly 40 when I finally decided that's what I wanted to do. But there I had uh, been teaching at that point at a small college, a small university in America. I loved the teaching. I knew the Jesuits had universities. At that age, I thought, well, I'll enter as a brother. I, I never really felt a strong calling to be a priest, even though I loved the Jesuits. But to be a Jesuit brother meant I wouldn't be a priest, I wouldn't be ordained, I wouldn't lead public prayer, um, which is fine, because I'm a nerd. And, you know, I'm, most people, when they come and tell me their problems, I'm trying to think, you know, why are you telling me? I can't help you out there. But I entered the Jesuits as a brother, thinking that I would be using my degrees as, as an instructor, as a professor at a small college or a Jesuit college. But of the three vows you take as the brother, poverty, I was used to. I'd been a grad student. And chastity, I was used to. I'd been a grad student. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Certainly in the days when I was studying, it was you know, nine to one male, female. Not anymore, thank heavens. But the third vow, the vow of obedience, was the tough one. 
because up to then I was pretty used to, you know, writing my own ticket, going where I wanted to go. As a Jesuit under obedience, they ordered me, without asking me, they ordered me to go to Rome, join the Vatican Observatory, which meant I had to eat that terrible Italian food and look at that terrible Italian scenery and, and live in the Pope's summer palace. And oh, by the way, it turns out, I had no idea, the Vatican Observatory is one of the world's largest meteorite collections in the world, and I was asked to curate it. Meteorites. Mention meteorites, how that got me excited about science in the first place. In fact, this was, if nothing else, uh, evidence of God's sense of humor, because I didn't know that they had the meteorite collection. They didn't know that I had a background in meteoritics. So I showed up and discovered that there was this collection and there was a need for a curator. And there I was with just the background. Need. It, I could not have invented it or planned it if I had tried. <laughs> Sounds like providence, all right. <laughs> And um, now today, so you spend, as you said, half the time in Arizona and half in the Vatican. Uh, what does the standard day in your life look like if there is such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, it's shifted a bit since about five years ago, they named me the director of the observatory. Uh, before then, I was just one of a dozen different scientists. Mm -hmm. And as a scientist in Rome, my standard day would be to get up uh, fairly early. Um, and after just maybe a cup of coffee for breakfast, to go and answer emails first thing in the morning, because in Rome, you're nine hours shifted from Arizona or California. So there's nobody sending you new emails, but you've got a night's worth of old ones to answer. A uh, great thing in Rome, at 10 o'clock, all work stops, and everybody goes to this industrial strength cappuccino machine. And we've got, you know, some real Italians who know how to make the cappuccino. So that's great. And that's when you actually get to talk to everybody. And then after coffee, at that time, what I used to do is to go back into the lab and do the measurements that would eventually uh, turn into scientific papers. Because I had this fascinating problem. I had a collection of a thousand different meteorites, but what am I gonna do with them? I can't carve them up, I can't do experiments, I don't have million dollar machines. But I realized that there was a way that I could make a fundamental measure of their physical properties, their densities, their porosity, their eventually their thermal properties. I could do that at low cost in my lab. Nobody else was doing that. Meteorites are really valuable. Curators won't let you do that. But I was my own curator, so I gave myself permission. <laughs> and we wound up publishing tables of numbers that are fundamental to a lot of science that other people are doing. Even when I started doing it, I had no idea how important these numbers would be for the science now. And so I did that for about 15, 20 years. And then a younger scientist came and joined our staff who had also been doing that work. He started out working with me and wound up doing it himself and doing it better than me. So he became the curator and I became the director. But that same pattern maintains itself. I'll do my writing in the morning and then do more speculative work in the afternoon. Here in Arizona, it's much the same, except that uh, I'll try to get up a little before sunrise so I can go for a walk before the heat of the day. The Arizona heat is, is pretty extreme. You know, it's, we're into October now, and the temperature will still get close to 40 by midday. So I'm Celsius, of course, I'm talking. And then I'll go and answer emails again, because all the emails from Europe have come and landed on my desk uh, in the morning. What I tend to do now is, is much more writing, and especially writing about science and religion issues, though I still keep a hand in with the science. There's an interesting parallel between being a scientist and being a religious. And it's this, that when I'm doing my science, it's me and the computer and I'm all by myself. When I'm praying, it's me and God alone in the chapel all by myself. But I could not do either of those things without an entire community of people around me whether it's the Jesuit community or the larger community of the church, 
who give me a sense of how I pray and, and how I can tell, how I can learn, how I can discern when something is a message from God and something is just, you know, a, a daydream from too much coffee. Mm -hmm. In the same way, I could not do science without the community of people, whether it's the, the colleagues that I have that I'm writing papers with, or the larger community who want to know about the data that I'm collecting, who are building spacecraft that go to the asteroids and therefore can compare what they're seeing at the asteroids with what we're measuring in our laboratory, which turns out to be pretty fundamental. So it's that marvelous balance of things you do yourself, but things you do in the context of a much larger community. So I still have my name on scientific papers. We just had a paper published this month on some of the measurements that my colleagues and I have made on meteorites and how that connects up with the asteroids that spacecraft are visiting now. Mm, wonderful. You also record uh, more of your background story in your wonderful book, Brother Astronomer Adventures of uh, Vatican Scientist, which is- And it's such a long book that I couldn't possibly go into it here, but it's such a good book. Everybody should buy two copies. You know, <laughs> just in case. Um, what makes the work of a Vatican scientist distinct from other scientists then, more generally? There are really two fundamental things that make it different. Because we're studying the same materials with the same tools and working with scientists who are not Jesuits. And, you know, we all studied at the same, you know, institutions in the same schools. But it's why we do it. And I say there are two things because there's two levels of why we do it. The first is I don't have to worry about getting funding. You know, I was nearly 40 years old before I entered the Jesuits. And before then, my funding all came from government grants. And government grants, you're competing with other scientists, so you tend to be very competitive. And, and the temptation is to treat science as a contact sport, knock down the other guy so I can get the grant money. That's a terrible way to do science. But the other part about a government grant is that it lasts three years, so you'd better have results after three years or you're not gonna get any more money. Mm -hmm. That means that because I can do a 10 or 15 year project and not worry about funding going away, I can take the time to do surveys of meteorite physical properties. It's one of the reasons nobody else had ever done it before, because it took 10 years to come up with a collection of data that were worth publishing. The deeper why am I doing it besides the fact of what's, you know, how am I going to get paid to do it, is what is my goal? What is it that is going to make me a success as a scientist? And my goal is not to win the Nobel Prize, uh, which is pretty good because I know I'm never going to do that anyway. <laughs> but my goal is not to glorify myself or get a bigger grant or get a bigger prize or get more papers that are cited by more people. My goal is ultimately to give glory to God. And that sounds very pious, I know, but it's very practical. It means that I'm not treating science like a contact sport, that I go out of my way to collaborate so that other people will use my science, or if they've got experiments that they can use with the, the meteorites, I'm very willing to loan those meteorites out to them to develop the science because the goal is to find the truth. And if that sounds too highfalutin, the goal is to find joy. Joy is evidence of God's presence in your work. And if you're not finding joy in your work, whether it's meteoritics or journalism or anything else, then maybe God's trying to tell you you're in the wrong place. But to recognize that that joy comes from being in communion with truth changes the way you do the science. It changes how cooperative you're going to be with other people. And for us, it changes the scientists we work with. Because I've got friends and colleagues who started out also being trained to think of science as a contact sport, knock down the other fellow. But it's not a game of rugby. It's not a game of American football. It's, it's a cooperative kind of game that you help out each other. And when you see a really clever or wonderful play, you go, that was great. And I'm proud to have been a part of it. Mm, it's a team sport. Wonderful. And um, how does the science of astronomy in particular then progress? So you said about um, things like engineering, more hands-on perhaps, despite mm -hmm. the sort of dearth of uh, tactile evidence that you have in astronomy. 
Time's up. Well, that's part of the joy of the meteorites. We do have the tactile evidence. And evidence of lots of things. Uh, early in my career, I worked with the theorist, one of the guys who worked out, Al Cameron, one of the guys who worked out how elements were made inside stars. And a lot of that was simply doing theoretical work based on data that were taken out of uh, nuclear reactors. But in the meteorites, which have grains of dust that come from other stars, we could see isotopes that either agreed with or didn't agree with his theoretical models, or in some cases inspired him to say, oh, there is a strange anomaly. I wonder what the process was that made that. And he you know, discovered a new process in the, in the process. So part of it is that we do have the tactile evidence. We've also got the light from these stars. And the light not only tells us what's happening far away in space, but because the farther back you look in space, the farther back you're looking in time. It took a lot of time for that light to get there to us. We're also looking back to earlier epochs in the age of the universe. But the greatest thing about astronomy to me is that, except for, you know, being on TV and, or writing books about it, it's not going to make anybody a lot of money. We're doing it purely for the joy of it. It does, astronomy does pull you out of yourself. I mentioned going into the Peace Corps. I mentioned how I was wondering, you know, why am I doing astronomy when people are starving in the world? When I went into the Peace Corps, I brought this little telescope with me. You can see it's small, it's compact, it fits in a suitcase. And I would set that up in villages across rural Kenya. We're talking 35 years ago. And of course, everybody in the village would come out because they wanted to see the rings of Saturn or the moons of Jupiter or the craters on our moon. And they'd go, ooh, and ah, just like I go, ooh, and ah, whenever I see them. Because that's what it means to be human, to be more than just an animal that eats and reproduces. And then about five years ago, I heard a great talk from a theologian that made it all click. Because this theologian was talking about Genesis, the first chapter of Genesis. And he said, you know, scholars have known for a long time that the, the basic storyline and the basic cosmology of Genesis chapter one comes from the Babylonians. And it you know, parallels a lot of what you see in Babylonian creation myths, except the things that are different Babylonians are the things that were inspired by. That's where you look to find the differences. The first difference is that instead of having gods fighting among themselves, Genesis has one God who is there in the beginning before there is a universe. So this God is supernatural. Singular God and supernatural, that's one. The second is that the universe is made by this creator in an orderly way, as regular as day follows night. And that's different from the pagan idea that the universe was made out of chaos. But the third and the most remarkable thing is, what is the climax? What is the pinnacle of creation? You know, to the Babylonians, it was the city of Babylon. To the God who is the creating the universe in Genesis, the last and most important thing that is created is the Sabbath. It's not even people. It's the Sabbath. And what happens on the Sabbath? You rest and you contemplate. And this is what we human beings were made to do. To rest, to contemplate, to worship. It's all part of the same thing. We were not made to work seven days of the week. The other six days of the week allow us to have the seventh day when we can rest and contemplate. And that's what astronomy is. God made us to be astronomers. <laughs> Beautiful. And um, then kind of dovetailing with your points there, what are the Christian roots of this kind of science in the Middle Ages um, that I guess a lot of people overlook these days? And particular the idea, the kind of myth that there were the dark ages and anti-science <laughs> and so forth. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about that? Well, of course, there are anything but dark. There were a <clears throat> tremendous, it was a tremendous era, a lot of history happening, but not a lot of it was written down. So people, you know, 
missed out on what was going on. Certainly by the year 1000, there was a lot of science that had been preserved by the Muslims. And you have to realize the story about Genesis that I tell you is the root of science, the idea that God is logical, that God is not a God of, of you know, lightning and thunder like the pagan gods. And that creator God is God found in, in Judaism, in Islam, and Christianity. Well, the Islamic world had preserved a lot of these ideas that the Greeks had had. And there was a young man, a Frenchman, uh, who's De Lerac, I can't possibly do the, the, the pronunciation of the name correctly because I can't speak French. Mm -hmm. But he lived in the border between France and Spain, and Spain was Islamic in those days. He studied the Islamic science. He came back, he came back to Europe, to the Christian side of Europe, with the armillary sphere and with the abacus and with Arabic numbers the numbers we use now. And he became Pope Sylvester II and introduced all of these things back into European thought. Within a few hundred years, uh, the, the Islamic Spain had fallen. That knowledge was captured and brought and formed the key parts of the European university system, University of Paris, University of Padua, University of Bologna where you first had to learn the trivial courses, the trivium, the three courses of you know, how to speak and how to write and how to reason. And then the quadrivium were courses about the universe, including arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Because these were sciences that allowed you to see how God worked in the universe. And you had to master them before you went on to get your doctorate in either theology or philosophy. Well, how does that relate to our modern universities? You mean, do modern universities have anything to do with that? Well, what kind of robes do you wear, especially when you graduate? Medieval clerical robes. And what is the goal? What is the final degree you get? What's the degree I have? A PhD, a doctor of philosophy, even though it's in, you know, in astronomy or geology. Our roots go back to that time. Our roots go back to the Middle Ages when there was a place and a time so that people who wanted to study the universe could make a living at it. Monks were allowed and encouraged to do that. And the roots of science are found in the medieval monks. People will always throw Galileo at you because, oh, Galileo shows the church was opposed to science. And I go, yeah, give me two other examples. The whole reason that the church was interested in Galileo because the church was interested in science. And the Galileo, everything you know about Galileo is wrong. The truth doesn't make the church look any better, but it's not the mistake that people think that it was anti-science. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact is Galileo hadn't proved his point with the science he had. It would take another hundred years before Newton and Newton's laws allowed him to, to de demonstrate that. But in the meanwhile, the church provided the educated populace, and the place where science could happen. And you can find that even well into the 1900, 19th century, well, actually well into the 1900s, because at the Vatican Observatory, um, when we moved out to Castel Gandalfo in the 1930s, there was a little more room to set up shop, the Vatican Library gave us all of their modern books dealing with science. To them, modern meant printed with a printing press. Mm -hmm. So you can go onto the shelf of our library and pick off the, you know, the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society from 1730 or whenever. You discover who was doing science in those days. Rich people, medical doctors, and clergymen. Because who else had the education and the free time to collect leaves, to go gather and, and sort. And yeah, you know, what is most of science? It's sorting and gathering data. What do we call sorting and gathering data? Clerical work. Why is it called clerical? Because mm -hmm. it was originally done by clerics. It's the same kind of record keeping that you do if you're running a parish. And so an awful lot of the science that was done until the 19th century was done by clerics. They were the ones that, and even afterwards, um, 
if you probably have a, you know, a cell phone in your pocket, mm -hmm. and if you look deep in the cell phone in the back someplace, you will find the names of two very prominent Catholics. And their names appear in every electrical thing you've got from televisions to toasters. And it's Mr. Ampere and Mr. Volta. Amps and volts are named for two guys who are deeply religious. And that's, you know, as, as late as the 19th century. Mm -hmm. The Big Bang Theory was devised by a Belgian priest. The genetic theory was devised by an Augustinian monk. Um, the electricity and magnetism that is explained by Maxwell's equations, the basis of ultimately, you know, relativity came out of this, but it's the basis of everything we're doing in sending electromagnetic waves, whether it's, you know, radio or radar or whatever. Well, who was Maxwell? He's a very devout Anglican. Religion has never stopped somebody from being a great scientist. So why does that myth survive to this day? Mm -hmm. Somebody's trying to sell you something, and I'd be very suspicious of it. It actually has much more to do with politics. It has absolutely nothing to do with the actual science of the religion going on. But that's a whole different story. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for clearing that up. You read it in your book. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of people, well, maybe too many people do still believe that, but hopefully we're starting to recover. I think nowadays there seems to be a kind of realignment, as it were, because, um, so I'll talk about Christ yeah. as the Logos. So I was, I'm going to ask you, why is Christ the Logos so important for the study of science itself? And then conversely, um, this kind of speaks to my point about some secular people who believe in logic and so on are starting to realign themselves with Christians against what I would call more fanatical Darwinians or postmodernist movements. And um, they seem to often reject objective reality and try to place science precisely at the hands of political ideologies and things like that. And um, I'm just wondering, do you have any thoughts about both those things? And <laughs> well, let's start with, with the Logos. Um, I'll go back to my high school where they taught me Latin and Greek. And one of the marvelous bits, because it's got only a few words and they go back and forth, so it's easy enough for a high school kid to, to be able to follow, is the opening of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the word. Enarche et Logos. Logos is the Greek word that we translate as word but it's also the root of the word logic. So you could imagine translating that phrase as, in the beginning was logic, in the beginning was reason. Mm -hmm. God is the way, the truth, the life. And truth is logical. But every logical system has to start with assumptions every logical system. And that's why you can have really, really smart logical people who are absolute atheists and other really, really smart logical people who believe that everything is chaos. And because you can prove any of those things depending on what you start with, depending on what assumptions you start with. The assumption of a Christian is the assumption of faith. I cannot prove mathematically that God exists, and just as well, because any God who I could prove mathematically would be subject to my mathematics and would be less than the mathematics, and therefore it wouldn't be God. Mm -hmm. But I can say, what if all the evidence of history is true, that there was a Jesus Christ who said and did the things that he said and did? Uh, incidentally, my science fiction background comes in here. No one has ever invented a fictional person that was anything like Jesus Christ. It's, it's just not the way you would write a story if you were inventing it. And we've got plenty of examples of people who have invented it. You know, fictional uh, messiahs are much more logical and much, much less profound. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so let's assume that what Jesus is saying is true. It does have that ring of truth in my gut. If I take that as my assumption and work logically, well, if that's the case, how should the rest of the world work? How should the rest of the world seem? Everything that I see in nature not only reinforces 
But because I am believing in a God who is supernatural, only such a God is capable of giving meaning to the universe. I think it was Wittgenstein who said, you know, a chair has no meaning unless there's something that's not chair sitting in the chair. The universe is utterly meaningless, just as, you know, the, uh, the, the modern <clears throat> postmodernist would want to say, but that's nothing new because you find that in the book of Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanity, all is vanity, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. That's the way the universe works if you don't have the assumption, if you don't have the bit of faith that says, I'm going to live my life assuming that this is true and just see how the pieces fit together. And they fit together so much better that way than any other way that it constantly gives me confidence that my faith is not just something that I invented. Trust me, I couldn't have invented anything that good. <laughs> yeah, marvelous. I think too, um, for me, the, the story of Christ the history of Christ is falsifiable. It then comes down to what are you including within your evidence and then certain people, but again, back to your point, will have certain assumptions about what counts as evidence, but yep. that's a kind of circular reasoning that, that they exactly. use. If that makes and sense. it's all circular reasoning, which is why I am not really hard on atheists. I have friends who are atheists and they're good people and they're doing their best and they're, if they're trying to figure out truth, they already worship truth and therefore they already worship God. They just haven't found that name to attach to it yet. Uh, there was a Jesuit who uh, taught me, uh, Michael Buckley wrote a book on the rise of atheism and he had a great insight. He says, to be an atheist, you have to have a really clear idea of the God it is you don't believe in because otherwise, how would you know you don't believe in him? Mm -hmm. And when you push them, you discover that most people who say they're atheists, the God they don't believe in, I don't believe in neither. Mm -hmm. But they haven't experienced the God that I believe in, so how can I blame them? Thank you. It's very fair for the guy. And um, so you mentioned Buckley there. Are there any other persons who've been especially inspirational or influential in your life that you'd, you'd care to tell us about? Well, the absolute number one is my father. Lived to be a hundred tremendous man. And he got me excited about uh, science and encouraged that when I was young. He got me excited about writing. He was a tremendous storyteller. And I've come to understand that doing science or being a religious person is very closely as, uh, affiliated with being able to tell a good story because <clears throat> there is a logic to how a story works. There is a logic to how a scientific paper works. And <clears throat> that allows me to to appreciate and communicate. He was also a great public speaker. He also had a fantastic sense of humor. And if you're not laughing, I mean, the universe gives you all sorts of things to laugh about, including yourself, especially yourself. And if you're not laughing, what's the point of it? He was a prisoner of war during World War II, Stalag Luft III, and very, very tough times. And at a reunion later on, somebody came up to him years after the war was over, and he says, you know what I remember about you in the prison camp? Wherever you were, people around you were laughing. What more wonderful thing could you say about somebody? So he's the one who taught me how to write, how to reason, how to speak, how to have fun. A second really important person to me was the uh, fellow who directed my undergraduate work, and including my master's thesis, it was a guy named John Lewis. And again, he had that sense of fun. I mean, this was the early 70s, and at one point he had waist length hair. He was an MIT professor with waist length hair, and you know, would spend his uh, lunch hours playing frisbee outside. <laughs> but he had a really lively imagination and an excitement about the truth. Someone came and he had, he had a grand theory for how you know, the solar system was formed. And somebody came one day with a bit of evidence that he thought completely disproved the theory. So I went, you know, aren't you worried about this guy? And he goes, worried? It's data. Let's find out what's real. And if I'm wrong, but I found out what's real, that's so much better. Which, you know, you think sounds obvious, but not every scientist would go there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And the great thing about him, too, was that uh, he followed his, his spirit. He eventually became a Mormon, 
very, very active Mormon. Well, I'm not a Mormon. I disagree with their theology, but I love the people. <clears throat> and I love the enthusiasm that he was able to share in that. So that was a big thing. <clears throat> and then Michael Buckley, this Jesuit who I got to know when I was a Jesuit, he gave me a reading course. Um, I'll just tell one story because it's you know, symbolic. I'm, I'm a scientist, I'm not a philosopher. <laughs> And I had always heard about this particular Jesuit theologian named Karl Rahner. Everybody said he was very difficult. So uh, I thought, well, I ought to read some Rahner. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, here's you know, his, his fundamentals of belief, try that. And I couldn't make heads or tails of it, even though it was in English. So I said, well, I've studied German. How about, how about if I try reading the German original? I got a dictionary, I got a chapter, and I'd, I'd translate it. And once a week, I'd go to Michael Buckley's office and say, okay, this is what I think he's saying in chapter three. And then after Buckley stopped laughing, he said, okay, no, this is actually what that chapter is about. <laughs> More often than not, was, I completely missed the point, even of what he was talking about, much less what he was saying. And that was wonderfully... Um, <clears throat> Well, it just made me realize that philosophy is not something that some physicists can just start up on the top of their head without even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Wonderfully humbling. We all need to be humbled. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Gay. And um, I want to take it now to another book that you have written, Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial, which should be, grab, grab people's attention right away, and other questions from the astronomer's inbox at the Vatican Observatory. So you did this with a Paul, Father Paul Muller, is that correct? And Muller, actually, he says Muller. It's, <laughs> it's one of the <laughs> Those are um, European names in America. <laughs> <clears throat> well, it's that, that subtitle that's really important because what it really is, is addressing some of, you know, six of the questions we get all the time. So as astronomers, the questions that, you know, people ask me about the Star of Bethlehem. What do I know about the Star of Bethlehem? I wasn't there. But they think because I'm an astronomer, I should know. So I, I wound up looking up things and discovering, you know, what can we say and what can't we say about it? So we've got a chapter about that. And the answer to that is, I have no idea what the Star of Bethlehem is, but I've got lots of ideas of what it might have been, including maybe it was a purely symbolic story or maybe it was an actual astronomical event. And I can name so many possibilities that I can't tell you it had to be this or it had to be that. Mm -hmm. uh, another one, Galileo. Again, I'm not a historian, but people always ask me about Galileo. So you dig into the history and that's where I realized, oh, everything that I thought I knew about Galileo is way too oversimplified. And the real story is fascinating, but it's a long, complicated, and, um, you know, nobody looks good, but everybody looks human. Mm -hmm. All the mistakes that people made, and everybody made mistakes, are the kind of mistakes that I could see making myself. You know, I understand why they would make those mistakes at that time. So I, I cut a whole, a whole lot of slack to all of them. People ask us about the beginning of the universe or the end of the universe, so we wrote chapters about that. And we wrote it as a dialogue because we wanted to communicate the sense that not that these are the answers and here I am the authority in the book, but here's Paul and me arguing with each other and coming up with it. You know, it's the dialogue that's more interesting than the answers. This goes back to something we were bringing up earlier, this so-called war between science and religion. And I think people who think there's a conflict have a very logical reason to think that. When you're a kid and you're learning science, you're given a science book. And if you wanna pass the science class, you have to get the answers in the back of the book. So you think that science is a big book of answers. And when you're learning religion, you're given a book, whether it's a, a catechism or the scripture itself. And you think that's what religion is. But that's not science and that's not religion. So it's not gonna be the case that the facts in this book contradict the facts in that book. Cause it's not about the facts. It's what you do with the facts. It's the conversation you have with the bigger community as you try to understand what are those facts. Um, how could you possibly reduce God to a set of words that have no more meaning than the words of the owner's manual of your car. God can only be communicated with words that carry extra meaning the way that poetry does. So yes, 
there are historical bits and you have to read the history, but even history is not just what happened, it's what it means. And you only understand what history means by talking about it and seeing it and living it. And if your knowledge of scripture doesn't change from the time you're 20 to the time you're 40 to the time you're 60, you haven't been paying attention. Mm -hmm. And likewise, science isn't, you know, the, the, the textbook that they gave you when you were 12, that's no more science than playing scales is the same thing as playing music. Science is exploring and using those ideas and understanding ever more deeply. There was a, a mathematician who had a phrase about mathematics, but I think it works for science too. He says, you never understand it, you just get used to it. <laughs> uh, the closest I can come is watching friends of mine who have been married for 30, 40, 50 years. They never solve who their spouse is, mm -hmm. but they love who their spouse is and they never stop learning more about who it is that they're married to. Marvelous, um, most insightful, thank you, Brother Guy. Um, you also cover some of Stephen Hawking's claims about gravity in the book, and um, I want to ask you about this, mm -hmm. it, um, this idea of a God replacement that people have. Uh, do you think that that's what they're aiming for? And um, so whenever I have certain atheist friends, they'll proffer the multiverse, for example, instead of our tra transcendent mm -hmm. and God. And um, are they making a category error whenever they do this? Or Of are, course. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> their picture of God is way too small because they still have the picture of God they got when they were 12. They probably stopped believing in God when they were 12. Would you trust a 12-year-old to do, make any other decision that affects your life so importantly? Mm -hmm. Even if that 12-year-old was you? <laughs> the people who wrote Genesis thought that the world was flat and there was a dome, and bigger than that was the God who made it. And that's still pretty big. You know, you go out and you look out your window, and it's a pretty big world that you can see, even though it looks flat and it looks like there's a dome overhead. And then we discovered that the world was round. We knew that by Greek times. And God is even bigger than that. And then we discovered that our world is going around a star that's one of thousands of stars. Well, now we know billions of stars in our galaxy. God is bigger than that. Well, there's now within the part of the universe we can see 200 billion galaxies each with 100 billion stars. God is bigger than that. And if you come back and tell me that there's a multiverse, God is bigger than that. But we've always known that because we've always used that word infinite. Mm -hmm. Here's the other thing that God is not only infinite in space, but also infinite in time. Let's say the Big Bang happened 13.8 billion years ago, the way we think it did, you know, this year. Ask me in a thousand years and we'll probably have a different idea. God did not make the universe 13.8 billion years ago and then walk away. A God who did that would be a God inside of space and time and not a supernatural God. But from medieval times, we recognize that God does not, creation out of nothing is not an act at one time. God maintains the universe. If you can show me, as Hawking claimed to be able to do, and for all I know, he's right. If you can show me that the Big Bang spontaneously erupts out of a fluctuation, quantum fluctuation of the space-time continuum. Why are there laws of physics? Why does existence itself exist? That creation point is only possible because there is space and there is time and there is change and there is fluctuation. But the creatio ex nihilo, nihilo is not, in that case, the nothingness is not just a vacuum. It's actual space and time itself. And God is creating that in all spaces and all times because our supernatural God is a God who is outside of space and time and chose to enter space and time in the person of the second person of the Trinity, who we know on earth as Jesus Christ. And are there other incarnations in other places? Ask me when we get there. Mm -hmm. Because I'm um, not going to second guess God to say there had to be or there didn't have to be. God can do whatever he wants. That's why we call him God. Mm -hmm. And is the, the theory then of the multiverse even 
a scientific theory proper or is that more oh, oh, it's a proper it's a proper scientific theory it's a way of getting around things that we don't understand otherwise um you know and it's this year's best theory ask me in a thousand years and we'll probably come up with something very strange and different we'll be answering questions we don't even know to ask now yeah <laughs> but if you think that the multiverse replaces god then I congratulate you because whatever concept of God you had that could be replaced by a multiverse is a God worth replacing. It's a God worth getting rid of. That's why we say we only believe in one God and we reject all these false gods. Because a God who did nothing more than set off the Big Bang is no better than Jupiter or you know, Ceres, you know, throwing lightning bolts or, or making the oceans rise and fall. If you think the universe is controlled by a bunch of nature gods, a bunch of pagan gods, that's all of the gods that we reject when we, we say, no, there's only one God, and that God is supernatural. Excellent. Um, let's move to another book, if we may, God's Mechanics, How Scientists mm -hmm. and Engineers Make Sense of Religion. So this might fit nicely what we're talking about. So in God's Mechanics, uh, you tell us some great stories about those who identify with the scientific mindset, so-called uh, so -called techies, when practicing religion. Mm -hmm. As a techie yourself, you relate some classic classical philosophical references, interviews with fellow techies, and your personal views and Catholic beliefs. Uh, what are some of the central joys of embracing a life of faith from a techie background or as a techie? Yeah, to, to be a scientist or an engineer, scientists and engineers are very different. I've studied at MIT, I saw the difference, but we both still have a common view of the universe that artists don't have or philosophers don't have. And it's not that we're right and they're wrong, but you've got to recognize that they're both human and they're both different. I'll pull back and remind you who was Jesus Christ, son of a carpenter. What is more techie than being able to build things out of wood. Mm -hmm. This in some ways explains why the Pharisees wanted nothing to do with them. You know, it's like you're trying to get your theology from Joe the plumber's son. That's what they thought of him. Although to be honest, if I had to live in a world without commuter, computers or a world without plumbing, <laughs> I'd get rid of the computers because plumbing is a whole lot more important. Excellent. And what that means is that you have to, you know, to be a techie, you have to have this wonderful combination of the vision. I can imagine the machine and why I would want it and how it might work. And the practicality of being able to say, let's build it. Let's see if it works the way I expect. And I think that combination of dream and reality is a good balance for any human being to have. Interesting thing happened when before I was a Jesuit, I taught at this wonderful place, Lafayette College, and I was the housemaster. We had 20 honor students living in the house, and I was the housemaster. And I had a number of art students, and I had a number of physics students. And to hear students, to hear people at the other professors describe the work they did, the physicists would talk about this particular theory I'm going to pursue because it's elegant because it's beautiful, because, you know, it makes my soul sing. And the artists would describe their art they're doing by saying, well, this balances that, and there's a lever. And the, they, in other words, each of them was trying to use the language of the other to speak in an almost poetic way about the, the unspeakable, the indescribable of what it was they were doing. So there's a lot of practical in being an artist. It's one thing to have the vision, it's the other thing to be able to pull it off so that it looks like the thing you had in your head, just as it is for, for an engineer. We've got a whole lot more in common than you would think. Mm -hmm. And um, are there any particular traps that can befall an, an unwary tacky believer? Would you like to tell us about? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, arrogance is the biggest. If you think you have it figured out, then you're wrong because you never have it figured out. One of the bits of arrogance that you find, especially in engineers, in, in science, if I have a great idea, but I can't convince anybody else that it's worth listening to, I'm dead. Nobody, the, the idea will die. If I'm an engineer and I build a widget and the widget works, even though I've got goofy ideas, you know, people will still buy the widget and I'll still think that I'm somebody important. Mm -hmm. 
Too many engineers think that they're the important people in their company. They don't appreciate that actually being a manager is really, really hard. That's why there are so few good ones. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they think that they're the smartest guy in the room. And their entire self-identity is that, well, I know who I am. I'm smarter than all these people. So the trap becomes this. They say, well, if I'm smarter than everyone else, I can't possibly agree with the common ideas of everyone else. And so if you tell me that idea is crazy, nobody believes in it, then I'll just say, well, that just shows that I'm smarter than you. When in fact, there's a good reason why nobody believes in that idea. It's a stupid idea. But this is how people fall into the trap of, you know, believing that there are UFOs, even though I can, you know, prove three different ways. That that's highly unlikely. Uh, or people will believe that there was a face on Mars, or people will believe that the world is flat, or people will believe whatever idea is not popular, they'll glom onto it because it's a way of feeding their ego. Because the other side of being a scientist or an engineer and having your identity being the smartest guy in the room is that deep down inside, you know, you're not. We've all got imposter syndrome. You know, I showed it up at, at MIT and everybody else said, these are MIT students, what am I doing here? <laughs> but every other student went to MIT also was looking around saying, who are these people? What am I doing here? And so you can either throw up a whole bunch of chaff and try to hide the fact that you're faking it, or you can embrace it and say, this is so much fun faking it and I'm getting away with it. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, another popular idea, I guess, or increasingly popular idea I wanted to ask you about was well, transhumanism and artificial intelligence generally. Um, so I have a close friend who's pretty atheist, like low voltage atheist, we might say, and um, he is kind of partial to some of these ideas. What do you think of some suggestions about the universe being a, thing, a simulation, for example? What difference would it make? I mean, at the end of the day, would it cause you to live your life any differently? <clears throat> I can't prove that that's wrong any more than I could prove that the universe was actually formed three seconds ago with all the atoms where it happens to be. And I just have this memory of yesterday, but yesterday didn't really happen. I'm just remembering it. And this is the, you know, the plot of science fiction stories that were boring by 1940. <laughs> so, um, having been at MIT, I, you know, had a, a roommate who worked in the artificial intelligence lab. And I know what artificial intelligence is. It's really clever programming. And the programming is clever enough that the computers are now do making calculations that faster than I could make them. But it's not the same thing as intelligence. It's not intelligence. It's, it's a misnomer. It's a really useful tool, but it's not intelligence. Remember... Sigmund Freud a hundred years ago, the most complicated thing that he was aware of was a steam engine. And so he described the human mind and the human soul in terms that were more appropriate for steam engines. Well, we know that steam engines are not the same thing as a human soul. What's the most complicated thing we have today? Computers. So it's very tempting to say that, ah, intelligence is just complexity. It's just, well, I know a lot of complex things that are not at all intelligent. <laughs> but again, it's trying to map on what's the cleverest thing we know of in this year. And I go back and say, what are we going to be talking about a thousand years from now? That will make, you know, computers look really ridiculous by comparison. One of the things I did as a young Jesuit, as a Jesuit novice, they assigned me for a while to work in a sheltered workshop with men who were um, severely mentally handicapped, some of them because of an accident, some they were born that way, you know, functional IQs of around 30 or so. And it was tremendously hard work and I really, really appreciate the people who do that for a living. But it made me realize that what they had and what they lacked had nothing to do with what computers do. Um, these guys could not count past three Computers can count as much as you want. But these guys could all speak fluent English, which even today it's hard to find a computer that you know, doesn't mistranslate or misunderstand what we're trying to say. It's a different thing. 
Yeah. It's not that we can't study it. We ought to study it. It's not that we can't have a lot of useful knowledge mapping out where in the brain these different bits occur. But we'll never be able to say, why does this neuron burning in this way give me the taste of chocolate? Because what means chocolate to me is something that I can't put into words or a formula. Marvelous. Um, just before we go, I want to ask you about one more book. There's so many more that I'd commend to people, <laughs> but um, Turn Left at Orion, which is now sold uh, over 150,000 copies and is one of the most popular astronomy books of all time. What moved you to create this helpful guidebook for the amateur astronomer? I needed it. I, I point out this telescope that I brought with me to Kenya. I took the telescope, but I didn't have a guidebook. And I only knew about half a dozen things to look at. And here I was in Africa, really dark skies on the equators. You can see the north and the south. And I knew I must be missing out on something. So when I came back, um, I decided I needed a book. There's, there's a wonderful, oh, do I have a copy of it here? I don't think so. There's a wonderful book written by the children's writer, H.A. Ray, the guy who wrote the Curious George stories. And he wrote a book on how to find the constellations. And I got that book when I was a kid. And I recommend it to anybody who wants to learn astronomy, who wants to be able to go outside and do more than say, gee, the stars are pretty. But to be able to know what are those stars and what did our ancestors think about them and what pictures did they see that we can see and what can we learn from the way that they saw the universe. I wanted a book that could do that for a small telescope. So I had a friend who was an amateur astronomer who had a good idea of what these things were. And we sat down and said, he said, here are the things that everybody with a small telescope should try to find. And I would then say, okay, how do we find them? Let's write it up and between the two of us. We came up with the book, but it's the book that I need to this day when I go out with my little telescope. Because the telescope allows me to focus on things in the sky that I wouldn't be able to see with just my naked eye, but I know they are there. It's, it's a very religious experience, first of all, to be drawn out to the beauty, but also to recognize that no matter what you see, there is more to be seen. The universe is inexhaustible. And taking a couple of steps with a small telescope is a great way of remembering that. And it also brings me joy. What did I say before? Joy is, you know, evidence of God's presence. So anything that would help other people bring joy and have fun and really learn to recognize what's in this universe, because since the beginning of time, God has revealed himself in the things he's made. And uh, your Protestant readers can identify where I swiped that from. You know, the Catholic who read scripture enough won't recognize it's, it's Paul's letter to the Romans. <laughs> Beautiful. And um, are anybody interested in getting that book? Or is the most recent uh, 2019 edition still okay? For yep, it's a great edition. It's, I'm not planning to do anything new to that. And, you know, if you wind up with an older edition on a used bookstore, don't tell my co-author. He, he lives off the proceeds, but, you know, help yourself. <laughs> Marvelous. And uh, is there anything else that you're working on at the moment or that you still feel a passion to get involved with in the future that you'd like to tell us about? One thing... You know, I'm doing the science and I could talk for another hour in the science, but then you'd lose your entire audience. <laughs> but one thing I am doing is with the Vatican Observatory Foundation, we're working to bring the fun of the science to anybody who's interested in it. And, you know, science that's coming from a Jesuit, so you're not going to get uh, science with an atheist uh, undercurrent to it. It's not what we do. We have a website called Sacred Space Astronomy. And about once a day, we have a new posting there. Sometimes it's news of astronomy. Sometimes it's what you can see in the sky. 